Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Ann Durkin Keating, who's a professor of history at North Central College in Naperville. She's co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Chicago, the editor of Chicago Neighborhoods and Suburbs, a historical guide, and the author of Rising Up, the book that she's here to talk about today, Rising Up from Indian Country, The Battle of Fort Dearborn, and The Birth of Chicago, all published by the University of Chicago Press. And I noted that the Encyclopedia of Chicago is probably the largest Chicago book on my bookshelf. I looked at it today. It's yay thick. <laughs> so, without further ado, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks for um, inviting me. And um, uh, yeah, the Encyclopedia. Is that my? Did I? Am I sounding okay? Okay. The um, Encyclopedia Project. We went with uh, the very largest book that the press would um, give us, right? So we went with. Uh, so you're absolutely right, Art. We went with. It is the, the biggest book they will do, um, dimension-wise and, and and height. But that was a lot of fun. That was a 20-year project over the 90s and the early 2000s. So. Um, I'm here to talk about a project that actually starts in that encyclopedia project because I was responsible for thinking about Chicago history before 1830. So um, that was, we kind of divvied up, the, well, actually it was before 1871, but I wound up doing a lot of thinking about before the fire because there were three co-editors and one of us did Yeah. <laughs> well, we don't want you to have no audio. Okay, um, but that's um, we'll so, work on it. Oh yeah, this project then comes out of my thinking about um, Chicago, um, particularly before eighteen. The eighteen thirty is an interesting year, and it's where we're going to end tonight. Eighteen thirty, eighteen thirty-three. Eighteen thirty is the year of the first plat of Chicago. So it, in, when I describe it to my students, I say that's the year that Chicago land became real estate. We can think about it as, uh, and then the Treaty of 1833, which is the year in which all of the land in this region, uh, the rest of the land that, what, that hadn't already been ceded, was ceded from the Potawatomi and their allies to the, the US government. So there's this enormous transfer of resources, land. The land becomes real estate and the story of Chicago as a, um, a capitalist venture that's an incredibly successful capitalist venture begins at that moment. But it isn't that there isn't a story before that. And the story before that is an important one and one that we really want to be thinking about, I think, um, the, even more now perhaps than when I started this project back now 15 or, um, yeah, it was almost 20 years ago, I think, now that I think about it. Um, so this is the, the book that's published. I didn't bring books, so I apologize for that. There are some flyers up here. The book's available, though, in hardback, paperback, and an e-book. Um, so you, um, you, can, you can order through Amazon. Um, it's probably the easiest way to, to go about doing that. Oh my goodness. I'm missing slides. <laughs> These are wildly out of, they're, they're weirdly, okay, the order is interesting. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so let me start here. Um, when we think about Chicago and where to start our history, and where to start the history of any place, uh, geography matters. Um, and. Chicago's at a um, continental divide. I know we're not up in the mountains, but we're at a continental divide, and that's a critical part of our story. And we know the, co the continental divide around here because we're between the Chicago River and the Des Plaines River. Um, yeah, we are right here still, yeah. Uh, um, and that divide, somewhere between there, is the natural divide between, yeah. Originally there, 
Here's yeah, the there you go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You've got it. And it's really important to have that in mind. And 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 um, that what does that what what does that matter? It matters because it means that the water we're we're at the connection between two major waterways, the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River Basin, which means that as long as people have been traveling, animals have been traveling, um, but people have been traveling. This is a, a connecting place. It's a crossroads. So um, we can really think about Chicago as a crossroads, even, I mean, from the very first parts of this story. So this is the Great Lakes. Let's see if we can go to, and the, divide, the, the Continental Divide is the, um, the dotted line here the, uh, that runs close to the Des Plaines River, but you see it again um, on the, the western side of the Calumet region before we rejiggered the whole of the, uh, the region. We're also on a dividing line um, between the eastern woodlands and the, and the plains. So Chicago's also at a crossroads between two really important uh, environmental zones. Um, we have in our region both woodland and prairie. And that also then is important for thinking about a crossroads between people who will take advantage of the woodlands and people who will take advantage of the prairie. And so uh, Chicago then is going to be a place that's contested by both all of those, about people who are in all of those areas over the course of time. But it's, got, it's important in that way. The other thing that I, as I start and, and as I, I think about this project, um, Chicago has a history that goes back hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds, and hundreds of years before 1830. And that's just really important for us to know. And we have evidence of that in a variety of archaeological ways. Um, archaeologists have been doing some kind of amazing work. The Illinois State Archaeological Survey has just um, has got some wonderful reports if you're um, want to do some Googling on them um, about the lake shore and the kinds of the groups of people that are living here. This I found, this was, um, uh, th again, this is in the encyclopedia, which is not only a book, but also online. So you can just Google and you'll get these maps. So these maps are, are readily available. But this is um, places that had ancient Indian earthworks. They can be um, actually a thousand years old um, in some of the cases, but you get some sense of in our landscape that there have been people living here and making their mark on the landscape for many, many centuries. Okay, I'm gonna fast forward 1600. <laughs> so when we start thinking about the idea of, of um, this region, when um, we're talking about the, 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 um, the, the, the um, when Euro-Americans, European colonists, European settlers are going to encounter the indigenous people of this area for the first time over and over and over again. But certainly beginning in 1600, it's going to be on an ongoing basis. And at that point in time, um, in this, this period of time, in the colonial, this what we call a colonial period, the period of settler colonialism between 1600 and 1830, and that 1830 is the date I began with and kind of ends that this whole era, which runs over 200 years, Chicago is at a crossroads. And you can see the crossroads there between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River um, very clearly there. And also the fact that um, you've got groups of indigenous people that are claiming the territories in and around Chicago, including the Ho-Chunk, the Menominee, the Ojibwa, the Potawatomi, Miami, the Kickapoo, the uh, Sauk out to the west. This is a complicated map, um, but let me talk to you a little bit about it because it speaks to a world that you might recognize from textbooks from a long time ago, and that is the idea of thinking about a French colonial era and then a British colonial era and then the American era. And what we're trying to do is think about, what I want you to be thinking about is the fact that through all of that colonial period, there are Native American, the Native Americans are controlling this, this territory. The Potawatomi and their allies control much of this uh, area um, 
for the, the period of time, certainly from the mid 18th century forward. So the green lines, the green names, are the people who really control this land. The red lines are the Euro-American claims on this land. So it's really, the, in this case, it's the British and the English who are claiming this territory. And the French and the British then are the red, dot, the red places are the places, in particularly in our area, that um, are a part of the French colonial story, which is overlaid onto the French wor world. So in this case, St. Joseph, uh, Fort Awutnan, who it, which is near um, uh, Purdue. So it's East Lafayette, uh, Detroit, Fort Miami near Toledo, Vincennes, uh, uh, Fort de Chart down at near um, Cahokia and, um, and um, Kaskaskia. So you get a St. Michelin-Mackinac, the places that are the colonial places that are overlaid onto this uh, Potawatomi map. And the interesting thing for me when I think about this is the, the, what we don't, what we don't, what you don't see in this map, but we want, I want you to be thinking about is, what's the interaction between this French colonial claim, the British colonial claim, and the Indian world that's underneath it, what, what, what's the glue is trade. So this is largely a trading world. It's a world where French or British traders are trading, that's T-R-A-D-E-R-S. Uh, we traders at some point later we can we could talk about as well. But what happens then before 1763, our region is French, French and Indian War ends in the Treaty of Paris of 1763, and the French are out of this region in terms of their um, political presence, their colonial presence in, this re in, in our area. But the French are, we don't, the traders stay. The, the colonial administration leaves, the British come in uh, after 1763, but very much this remains Indian country, the French traders stay, and then overlaid on that are British traders as well. So we've got French traders, British traders, and Potawatomi who are living in this region after 1763. Now, if you're thinking about your US history, um, all of this is a part of that US history, but you may find something that might, might uh, ring a bell would be like the Proclamation Line of 1763, which was um, a line that was um, created after the Treaty of Paris in 1763, where indigenous people were not included in the negotiations, and Pontiac's rebellion that comes in 1763 forced the British to say, well, we're going to have this line, this proclamation line. East of the proclamation line, American settlers can be. West of the proclamation line is, is Indian country, is where uh, indigenous people are going to stay and live. And that is an important line in terms of the story that's going to unfold here. Okay, so getting rid of the lines. <laughs> There's two, two kinds of settlement then that I, want, I, I focused on and that I, I want to talk to you a little bit about today. And the one is some of these names should look familiar. They were the French places that, got, that were overlaid into this world. They're mo mainly trading outposts. So, uh, and some of them are also going to be for government. But Vincennes, Peoria, uh, Milwaukee, Portage, Green Bay, Wisconsin Rapids, Fort Wayne, um, Gross Point. Those are the places that the Euro-Americans are trading at or they've got outposts uh, out in Indian country. But mostly what we're looking at in this uh, world are Indian villages. And this, is, this takes us to 1830, so it's not a snapshot for the whole time period, but just in 1830. Um, Helen Hornbuck Tanner, if you um, have an interest in Indian, where, in, where indigenous people are living in the Great Lakes region from 1600 through the 1830s, uh, Helen Hornbeck Tanner uh, spent decades at the Newbury Library uncovering these stories. So this is a map that's based on her um, her investigations. It uh, appears in the encyclopedia, it's also in my book, but what it does here is it shows 
um, every one of the triangles, and I know you can't see that, but know that the triangles, each one of them are an Indian village. And so this is territory that's, that's claimed, that's controlled by Native Americans, and in our area it's the Potawatomi and their allies. And some of the villages, uh, again, the Potawatomi are found on both sides of the, the lake, um, along the Calumet region, and all the way west, um, past the Fox River. Uh, you'll find Potawatomi up in, in um, southern Wisconsin and again over into Michigan. Many of the villages are multi-ethnic, that is, it won't be just Potawatomi, but other uh, indigenous people as well. But that's, that's the, and the, the um, Helen, when she did this work, the triangles are where summer, um, the summer farms are. So to get a sense of, because there's a seasonality to this map, so this is a map of when um, the Potawatomi were together with, uh, farming their fields, when the women were, were raising corn, beans, and um, squash, which are the, the key things that they're going to be raising. And it's going to be women raising in these villages from the late spring through the summer. Uh, this is, these are the places. And the Potawatomi and their allies would come back to these very same farm fields for uh, dec well, for decades until they then moved to another set of farm fields for a whole variety of reasons. So they were claiming resources. They didn't own land. They were not claiming um, individual or even group, group land ownership, but they were claiming the resources. So at other times of the year, the Potawatomi would move after the, the, uh, the harvest in the fall, they would move into small, they would break up into smaller groups, and those smaller groups would be hunting through the winter and eating the foodstuffs that they'd, they'd saved from the harvest, and then in the spring fishing, maple sugaring, and then coming back and starting all over again. So they were in smaller groups in the winter time, larger groups in the summer. This represents then the summer, the summer mapping in 1830 of that story. George Winter, whose uh, work is at the Tippecanoe Historical Society, has got some incredibly uh, um, powerful images of Potawatomi and um, their allies. Uh, this goes really mostly from the 1830s, but I use this a, a lot in teaching because to me this gives uh, students and it gives me a sense of what an Indian world is like, what this Indian world is like. And this is an Indian world in which for now generations, for over 150 years, Native Americans, the Potawatomi, have been trading with the French, the British, with American traders for goods in exchange for mostly um, uh, skins of various uh, animals. But um, what they're trading for are, and you can see it here, they're trading for cloth, which is an enormous part of the, the, tra the fur trade, will be exchanged for cloth. And the cloth that they're trading for, they are not then creating um, uh, European fashions. I mean, when I look at this, 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 this reminds me of an Indian world, that this is the Potawatomi taking what they, these, these, these goods, these Euro-American goods, and making them into something that's different from what men and women would be wearing in Philadelphia or New York or London during these years. It's, um, but it's taking the same materials and making something different of it. And I think that, to my mind, says a great deal about what Indian country is what it meant to be in Indian country. It was a trading, it was a trading world where things were taken from Euro-Americans and then used this way. Iron pots, uh, certainly a big piece of this. Uh, guns and arms, uh, bullets, um, liquor are all a part of this trade um, for better or worse. Uh, and they transform the Potawatomi world. The Potawatomi and their allies who are living in the late 1700s their way of life has been dramatically changed over the period of time since their forebears were here and, and not encountering the, Euro the European traders. Does that make some sense? So it's like the Potawatomi New World. So I mean, they too have fashioned this new world in this encounter, but they control this world. We've talked about that. Okay. Into this world, then, we've got individuals, uh, Euro-Americans, that we can talk about that then start to claim firsts, right? So this is Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable. Well, 
you don't know what Jean Baptiste Pointe will look like exactly. This is a wonderful imagining of him by an artist about 15 years ago, which now sits at the, on the north side of the DuSable Bridge, the, the Michigan Avenue Bridge, so just near where Tripping Tower used to be. I guess everything's got different names these days. But the DuSable, Jean-Baptiste Point DuSable, all we know about him is that he was an incredibly handsome man, because that's how he's described in, that's the one thing we've got about him, is a handsome man. Um, and um, the, the sculptor sculpted um, an image of his son which I just thought was, it, every time I look at this, it makes me um, smile when I think about a sculptor choosing when he knows that what he knows about this man is that he's a mixed race man who is uh, handsome and he, he, um, he, he sculpts his, uh, based, the sculpture based on his son. Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable comes to Chicago, the Chicago area in the late 1780s and he's the first person then that's starting up a trading outpost. There's been a mission at Chicago, and we could, we could talk about the mission if you want to. I'd be happy to. But Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable, then, is the person that we see as the first non-native settler here. So that means it's not doesn't mean that he's the first person that's living here, just the first person who is non-native. And it matters, because what he's going to do is set up, not surprisingly, a trading outpost here. His, his place in this world is as a trader. Um, and uh, Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable will be at Chicago. He builds a, a, a house on the an, an trading outpost, again, pretty much by tr where Tribune, Towers is, uh, Tribune Tower is. And uh, he, and it, he marries an Indian woman, um, maybe Potawatomi, maybe Illini. We're not absolutely sure. Um, but she and uh, her husband raised two children here. We do know they were, they, their marriage was uh, solemnized at solemnized in um, Cahokia at the church in, at St. Anne's, I think, in Cahokia. And also their children were baptized in Cahokia. So they go down south. So there's some argument that Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable came from the south. We know he's a mixed race man. He may have been enslaved as a young man. Again, we know very little about him beyond that. He's there then at Chicago through the 1790s and into, into, uh, into eight, at, at to 1800. His next door neighbor is also an interesting person. His next door neighbor is a woman by the name of Archangel Olmet. Um, we don't have any photographs of these people. So Archangel Olmet, this image is a WPA image that stood in the Wilmet public, pub, excuse me, the Wilmet post office because Olmet is, um, the Wilmet is the anglicization of Olmet. And um, this was an image that was created from a photograph of the daughter of Archangel Met. So we know it's got a resemblance, but we're not exactly sure that this is what Archangel looked like. But Archangel grew up in a Potawatomi village, so one of the triangles, down by the Calumet. And Archangel marries a French fur trader sometime in the 1780s, and she comes to Chicago with her, she and her husband come to Chicago, Archangel and um, Antoine Ulmet. And they come and they are going to raise a, mix, a family of mixed descent children next door to, the, to, to Jean Baptiste Point du Sable. I find Archangel really interesting. She plays into the 1812 story, so she's an interesting person. She's, again, um, in, in a marriage that's very typical that is, of an Indian woman married to a French trader. And um, they will have mixed descent children. So this Indian world, this Potawatomi world, is a world that's getting very mixed up by the late, 18, late 1700s, early 1800s. That is, lots of people have ties to both the Euro-American world and to the Potawatomi and their allies. Does that make some sense? So that's really, you know, that's, that's uh, an archangel. So archangel and her family stay at Chicago from the 1790s all the way into the 1830s. And, um, you know, they stay, they go up to Wilmette, but they're in this area. So they're an interesting family to follow because their story then tracks the one that, that, um, that uh, I want to talk a little bit about here. Treaty of Greenville, uh, 1795. Who knows whether it looked like this, but um, without photographs, we just um, we get the, the artistic renderings. But this is, again, over in Ohio, 
Indian uh, fighting between uh, the new American government and indigenous peoples across Ohio, and what are they fighting about? They're fighting about whether the land in Ohio is going to belong to the settlers who are moving westward or will continue to be controlled by the Miami and their allies when we're looking at the Ohio, and that's going to continue westward. So this idea of what the US government is, is asking for is for sessions of land, demanding sessions of land, often at the end of a war, that are gonna move native peoples further west and begin to restrict what, Indian, what, what is Indian country across the whole of what is now the Midwest. So I'm back to one of these maps. Okay, so let me tell you what I've got. We've still got that, the green underlay, Indian country, but what you see here, and you see the Treaty of Greenville line in 1795. Remember, we had that proclamation line of 1763. Uh, now we're moving west, right? So this is tr the Greenville Treaty in 1795 moves, is moving. So everything to the east and the south will um, be in American, it's down to the Ohio River, will be in American hand, in the U hands of the U.S. government. Land will become real estate. It moves out of the hands of the indigenous people. And everything then north, in 1795, the agreement was that would remain permanently Indian country. But guess what? <laughs> That's not what happens, right? You guys know, you guys unfortunately know the, the punchline here. So what's happening, and this is, again, I don't want to over, over complicate this story. But essentially what's going on is you see the Greenville Treaty Line and what's going on here is pretty much every couple of years over the next 15 years, the US government is demanding sessions, often at the end of a war that native peoples, indigenous peoples are losing. So 1803, 1805, 1809 Treaty of Fort Wayne, um, 1804, it's a treaty with the SOC, it's a St. Louis treaty. But what you start to see here then is the um, US government is ringing around Chicago in an interesting way, is so that the center, what's left in Indian country in this area is that center. And Chicago's in that center. So Chicago's a part of, remains a part of Indian country, but it's increasingly clear that what's gonna happen is this is going to continue to diminish. The Indian country is going to continue to diminish. Of course, if you want to think about this, we've got the Louisiana Purchase off to the side, which complicates this. But keep that in mind, because what happens then is Fort Dearborn is created at the mouth of the Chicago River in 1803. The Miami, who don't control this territory, seed land at the mouth of the Chicago River to the US government back in the Greenville Treaty. And so the US government in 1803 comes out here and builds a fort, south, south side of the Michigan Avenue DuSable Bridge. So basically right there, um, the, where the plaques are in the sidewalk are not quite right, but they're not far. I mean, they're, 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 they're close enough for, certainly it's close enough for, um, for us to get a sense of where they are. So they build this fort as an outpost in Indian country. It's the furthest, this is, we're at this point, we're just to the Mississippi River is where the, the US stops. It's not good. By the next year, it'll be the Louisiana Territory and it'll be in the middle of the country. But when this is first built, it's out in the middle, it's out on the western frontier. Another image of the fort. More images of the fort. Now, a couple of things. By the time that Fort Dearborn is built, 18, it was started in 1803, finished in 1804, you see the, up at the top of, the, of this uh, image, the, of this map, there's the Kinsey House. The Kinsey House has been, uh, is, was the Jean Baptiste Point du Sable House. And John Kinsey comes in and um, you can't buy the land because the land doesn't, the land is not real estate yet in quite the same way. So what, what sold, Dean Baptiste Point to Sable sells out his improvements on this land. There's an intermediate buyer, but the Kinsey family, John Kinsey, will take control of it. And he will have a long-term relationship with Fort Dearborn. He's coming from, um, from um, St. Joseph, near St. Joseph, Michigan, and then before that in Detroit. Um, 
and he has connections with um, down near down near Fort excuse me Fort Wayne as well. But this is there. So Jean Baptiste Pointe du Sable is leaves the area. There's lots of speculation. We just don't know much about him why he leaves, but he leaves pretty much when the Americans decide they're going to come in. So you know the idea that he may have understood that this makes the U.S. this makes Chicago a flashpoint for conflict um, between Potawatomis in this area and the U.S. government. You know whatever it's a it is he doesn't or he doesn't want to be in a spot that's right on a U.S. outpost, but he leaves. He's going to die near St. Louis um, in um, actually it's after the War of 1812, but he's. That's, uh, that's the story we've got, got here. Let's see, we've got more on um, what the barracks look like. Um, this is um, Julia Kinsey's rendering of what the Kinsey house looked like. But I keep in mind, this is Jean Baptiste Pointe du Sable's house, you know, and that he sold. And it's already, by this point, is 20, 15, almost 20 years old. So by, as we're going along here, but that's, He's going to run a fur trade operation out of here. He's also going to be trading with the fort. Um, okay. So now we're getting to the, 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 the battle. You probably, maybe some of you will recognize this guy, um, Tecumseh, Sean, uh, and his brother, the Shawnee prophet, Tenskwatawa, uh, have a really interesting role to play in this story. So Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa believe that um, that you need to stop and fight against the US government at this point. So now we're talking 1805, 1806, 1807. Why? Because the US government is demanding more and more land in this area. And Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa try to organize a pan-Indian, so crossing um, tribal lines, a pan-Indian um, uh, movement that will resist the US government's attempts to purchase more land, to take more land in this area. And what they're going to focus on, that donut, that area in the middle, well, it's not the donut, the middle of the donut, the, the hole, the center. Um, and it's, you can see it here. Um, it's basically the territory, the, you see the shaded area here is all of the area that Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa claim as their native the lands that they are going to control. And they operate out of Prophetstown at the, on the Tippecanoe River, again near West Lafayette today, so you have some sense of where we're talking about in Indiana. So not too far from Fort Dearborn. So kind of equidistant, not, not quite equidistant, but from Fort Wayne and, and Fort Dearborn. So they're there, kind of, and again, why, why here? Because all around them, the land has been ceded. And this is, they are going to be the, the flashpoint for an Indian war that will start in 1811 and move into 1812. And the Battle of Fort Dearborn is a part of that. So let me talk a little bit about what happens there and then I'll read a little bit about this and we can finish up and talk about uh, what we've got. So what happens in, um, I can go to the next slide maybe I can come back, yeah. What happens here is in November of 1811, we get the Battle of Tippy Canoe, which again is something that we kind of hear about because it's kind of in our, whatever it is, jingling around in our heads um, from the 1840 election with William Henry Harrison. How can it be that we remember that? The Battle of, of uh, Tippy Canoe is one of those things that we, we know, or many of us know. At any rate, what it is is William Henry Harrison, the U.S. Ju uh, a, uh, uh, the governor, but he also commands militia troops from Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio, comes in and burns Prophetstown in November of 1811. When Tecumseh, a warrior, is off with his warriors going south of the Mississippi River trying to get more people to sign on to this pan-Indian um, uh, confederation. And um, Tenskwatawa, who's um, the prophet, he's the, the religious side of this nativist tradition, is in the, in the villages around Prophetstown and they're burned to the ground. And I, I, you know, it's one of those things where when you burn Indian villages, you burn villages and you burn people out of their harvest in November in, in this region, 
you are condemning them in many ways to either starving to death or freezing to death or having to if finding someone that will take them in. So their Indian villages are burned down. So I think this is a really, this is a tremendous act of violence in November of 1811. As a result of that, when Tecumseh comes back, the Indians in this confederation say, we will start a war, we will continue this war, which has begun in November of 1811 in, after the harvest, the following year's harvest. So at the end of August, beginning of September, uh, and into October of 1812. So that's their plan, is to do that. The problem, well, it's not a problem, but it's a complication is that the US government declares war against Great Britain <laughs> in June of 1812. So there's a second war that begins in this region. And so, for instance, Mackinac, which was held by American troops in 1812, very quickly after the US declares war against um, against um, uh, Britain in, 18, in, Ju July, in June of 1812, um, Mackinac is, falls to the British. I mean, this is the battle where the British built the fort originally, they the Americans take the fort um, after, the, after Jay's treaty, and when this war begins, the British know that they can just come from, I, if you've been to Mackinac, you know this, you know, it's got this great bluff and this wonderful uh, front where that can be that's very it's impregnable but you know what you can just walk up the back of the fort you don't have to do you don't have to attack from the front you can basically just walk in from the back and that's what the British do they walk across the island Mackinac Island and take the fort anyway we've got those two wars going Chicago then gets caught up in this so when I when I look at the battle of Fort Dearborn it's a battle that's involved in two wars it's a part of two wars so by August of 1812, the commander at Fort Dearborn has been uh, ordered to leave Chicago and go to Fort Wayne because um, Mackinac has fallen and they're worried that they're not going to be able to hold Chicago, which I think is fairly, is, fairly uh, is, is on the mark. The problem is that there's this second war that's already underway and it's that second war that will cause, that's going to lead to the Battle of Fort Dearborn on August of August 15th of 1812. Let me just, I thought I could read just a little bit, a bit of the, the battle itself. So this is on the morning of Saturday, August 15th, 1812. A ring of temporary camps encircled Fort Dearborn. The Indians carefully guarded all the trails in and out of Chicago. Indeed, in some ways, the fort was already under siege when Captain Heald led his troops out from the fort. Despite this, Captain Heald expected the Miami and Potawatomi warriors. He expected some Miami and Potawatomi warriors to provide him with some protection, but he was going to be attacked by Tecumseh allied uh, warriors who were a part of, they were, they were taking, they were moving forward from what had taken place mm -hmm. in Prophetstown in November of 1811. And so they're going to be attacked. Um, let's see. Um, so there's this column that leaves on August 15th from Fort Dearborn at the, on the Chicago River, and the column comes along the lakefront. And the column includes, again, Captain Hill was in the front of a column of 56 regular troops, 12 men composing the militia. John Kinsey, whose house we saw, rode alongside Captain Heald and Captain Wells at the front of the contingent. And uh, again, he was hoping that he would be able to keep uh, an attack at bay. At the rear of the column, and this is again another part of this story that I'd be happy to talk more about, uh, were wagons with children's supplies and baggage. Um, there weren't supposed to be any settlers in this area. American settlers didn't belong in this area. There were just supposed to be soldiers. But there were American settlers because there were lots of reasons why people stayed after they, they gave up or they left their commission in the army. Um, they just stayed. They, they provided food for the army. They, the Lee family lived nearby. Uh, 18 children with their mothers, either with them or alongside them. And um, a again, a young soldier in the retreating force remembered that he had proceeded about a mile and a half between the lake and the sand dune when it was discovered the Indians were preparing to attack us. The Potawatomis who had, pro had promised to provide an escort and turned 
in, instead turned on the contingent. And the attack followed a simple pattern that the Potawatomis had long used in surprise attacks on their enemies. Mad Sturgeon and Blackbird used, uh, again, uh, employed stealth, ruse, and ambush. Their weakness was the lack of unity and discipline, making it near impossible to take a fortified position by force of arms. So the, the column is leaving Chicago. They're attacked at a sand dune about 12th Street at the, at, uh, at, at 12th Street along the lake shore. Um, and they really don't have much of a chance. At the end of this attack, It's, it, this is, takes place in just a little over an hour. Much of the violence was over in short order. Captain Heald remembered that all of their horses, provisions, and baggage had been taken within 15 minutes of the attack. Um, again, the battle itself is over in an hour. He reported that about 15 Potawatomi warriors lost their lives in this fighting alongside 38 of his own men. Almost all the remaining soldiers were injured, including Captain Heald, who suffered gunshot wounds in his thigh and right forearm. And, the end, and there's going to be a, there's an interesting story of what happens to the survivors of this fight and how some of them are, um, are ransomed from um, different Indian groups and also from the British over the course of time. But what I, I think I'll, I'll leave it with, the idea that this is a part of a broader um, war, an Indian war, that Tecumseh is heading out of Prophetstown. Tecumseh has gone over, though, to fight alongside the, of the Detroit, excuse me, alongside of the British at Detroit. And he's going to be killed in, um, in the fall of 1813 at the Battle of the, of Tam, the Thames uh, River Battle. So um, it, this winds up being, Chicago winds up being the only real victory here. Fort Wayne, instead of evacuating Fort Wayne, the commander at Fort Wayne, um, basically um, survives a siege. And um, there's an argument that probably it would have worked at Chicago as well. But the, the battle, the fighting at Peoria, at Prophetstown early on, Fort Wayne, St. Joseph, and around Detroit really are where um, Tecumseh's uh, warriors and allies fought against the, um, the US government and US settlers in the area. The end result of all of this is that the U.S. wins both those wars. Um, the, the, um, the, uh, the, even with the, the success at the Battle of Fort Dearborn in, in August of 1812. And what does that mean? That means that all of this is, every one of these um, uh, uh, letters re uh, represents another session that the Indians living in this region were forced to make to, uh, to turn over their lands to the American government. So basically, this comes as a result. These are from 1816, so at the end of the War of 1812 through 1833, every one of these parcels then leaves no land left that was not unseated by Native Americans. So by 1830, 1833, there is no Indian country left in um, Northeast Illinois and southern Wisconsin. Um, yeah, you got to, I'll go ahead, you have a question. Are you sure? Okay, because I'm, I'm just about end and I'm happy to take questions or discussion about what's going on. So this, these land sessions then are at the heart of, we think about the Battle of Fort Dearborn kind of out there. It's a big part of this process of moving land from Indian control to U.S. government control, turning land turning land into real estate that, um, again, is at the base of the story that we tell at Chicago. A wonderful map, another wonderful map for me, is initial land cells in East, Northeast Illinois. So this is when does land in our area become real estate. Um, so the yellow is the very earliest. It's on the canal corridor. That was the, some of the earliest land that was seeded um, going back to 1816 even before Illinois was a state. And uh, so those properties could be purchased as real estate in the 1830s. So that's the yellow. And then um, uh, into the orange is even in the 1830s. And the green is the 1840s. And the, the blue and then the purple are take us into the 1850s and 1860s. 
um, the reason that you see that the land doesn't go quickly, like in, in all in just a few years, is uh, the blues and the purples are going to be places that were largely um, underwater. They were, they, were, they were swampy. They were so swampy they were, not, they were not seen as usable until you could start tiling. And once you could uh, figure out how to tile the, the, the farm fields, they could stop in that way. Um, and yeah, this is, this is where I started my dissertation was, I started Chicago here in 1830 with the first plat of Chicago that was done by the canal commissioners. Orientation is, um, this is north, of course. We've got, we're going the wrong way, I think, here. But um, not going the wrong way, but not oriented the way we, we're used to. But the, um, the plat is um, the end of a long story rather than just the beginning of a story. Uh, and I think I'll stop there, and I'm happy to take questions or comments. So we're going to ask for the purpose of being able to bring the microphone to you. Who's got a question? On one of the maps, you hear the Brits, the French, and the Spanish, but you never talked about the Spanish. Yeah, what so. What was their influence? Yeah, what the, was their importance? Yeah, the Spanish are. Um, Spanish up here yeah. after 1763. So, what's going on is. Um, Spain takes control of much of Louisiana after 1763. Part of it is the end of the French and Indian War, but it's also a separate negotiation between France and Spain. So France is out of North America. They're in the Caribbean, but they're out of North America after 1763. That is, as a colonial force, still a lot of French traders, and families living in this region. Was there more behind that question? So the, 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 the Spanish will control Louisiana into uh, the Napoleonic Wars. When Napoleon takes control of the Iberian Peninsula, um, he, is, he will then, that's when the land sale is made of Louisiana, which is Napoleon selling Louisiana to the US. But it's actually during a period of time when Napoleon is controlling the Iberian Peninsula. So that does that. So the Spanish, the Spanish influence on this region is in large measure through their presence at St. Louis. I would say that's where I see the most. Um, but in large measure, this is a French story um, before 1763 and even after. You just mentioned that after I don't remember the year that the French are out, that the French are still in Quebec. The, um, the, the, as I said, the French, the French remain the people who have settled, and the traders remain. But the British control Quebec after 1763, and that's in fact so. That's one, and that's again one of the the, the pieces that will lead us to revolu the American Revolution. But no, that's that's ex yeah, that's that piece is there. Now, any apologies. I grew up in Shore Park. Okay, right. so you've got the Bobien. And Chichi Pinqua, Robinson was over there. Right, I mean, right, Robinson, and we've got Caldwell here. Land. What? They were allowed to keep their land. Well, so here's the deal. Oh, here's they the deal. Up and they were allowed to keep but, their land. But, they, but that land, oh, and I don't have a good map. I don't think I have the map with me. It's the 1829 treaty that they, they are, those families, so Robinson, or Robin, Robinson family, the Caldwells, um, um, oh my gosh. Uh, Ulmet, so the Ulmet family, um, oh my God, there's more, I'm blanking on their names. It's much of the um, St. Adelbert Cemetery, so there's pieces up there too were uh, also, um, so those lands are granted to individuals, they're mixed race people, so they are not, um, they're, they're, they're not granted to, uh, Oh, I'm not arguing that, but in the eyes of the U.S. government that's making this, they, they see it, I'm not, oh, I'm not, I would never, I would, you're absolutely right, but the U.S. government is making those grants of land to, from the standpoint of they are mixed race, that they have European, that they are Euro-American. Um, 
Oh, so the, they're getting these lands because of their help in the Battle of, of in, in 1812. But it's not tribal land. But it was kept by them. It's kept by the That's family. That's why we have the Displains Woods. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, it, the, it's, it's family land. So it's granted not, so it's not a, it's not a reservation. It's land that's granted to the Caldwell fam, to Billy Caldwell. He doesn't have a family at that moment. So Billy Caldwell, the Robinson family. What? I yeah, exactly. Saganash, right. Yeah. So I mean, uh, at the Robinsons, um, the Ulmets, it's as, it's, it's, it's in return for um, favors that they've done for the US government, debts that are owed to them, seemingly as a part of that brought, that those treaties. It's, it's actually, again, it's the late 1820s treaties. Oh, I'm not, I, man, I'm not arguing that, but. But it is ceded to them. So the, their land. I, I, um, the only land that there's possibility of tribal lands is out near Rockford, at least at the moment, right? So the Rockford. Uh, land that um, was it, it comes in the same in the same treaties in the late 1820s. But there, there was a grant of land to a um, a, a I think it's a Potawatomi um, leader, a warrior who took it on behalf of his tribe. Oh, I'm not. Yeah, I, I bet I was just there. I mean, I've been there. Yeah, I'm not. I, I would agree entirely. But the land is not. It's so. It's land. What? It's not to the tribe. Like Billy Caldwell was married to the Potawatomi. Right. So it was intermarriage, but it wasn't tribal. And the idea. So what happens? That can I just say a couple things about that land? And I'm not disagreeing that the Robinsons are going to stay there and then they're going to lose the land. And so can I say just a little bit about how they lose that land and how the Ulmets lose the land? And Caldwell, to some degree, is the same issue. Is that they don't, they get the land but they have to have permission from the President of the United States. Am I got that right? Yeah. <laughs> to, um, to, uh, to, to sell that land. So they don't really have, they don't have the same kind of control that somebody who bought property in the Illinois-Michigan Canal <laughs> had the right to that property. Talk to me a little bit more though about why, uh, I mean, I, I think the line that you're, so the, the, the tribal, the, so the, oh, the, the, the Rockford case, right? So that's a story where there's now a court case that I think is actually acknowledging the legitimacy of that as reservation land, not as uh, privately owned land. And I will have to, well. I do apologize because I do know that the last surviving member of that tribe died in the late 50s in the woods. I actually found the foundation. Of oh, 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 but. Uh, so that's, that's why I'm just kind of like. Mm, so, so the, and here's another thing that just, and just to add, probably add um, uh, ammunition to, to your discussion is if we were in Canada, uh, mixed race people are identified as indigenous people. And that's not the case in the U.S. So, to your point, that would add more. Arg that would add more, another layer to the argument that you're making. The Robinson family, though, it's the Robinson family and their descendants who would have the claim to that land, not a tribal claim. Oh, it's a and, and right, and 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 I think the Caldwell would be the and Ulmet has been the same thing and and. And the way that got sold, there is not one of those parcels that isn't a little hinky in that process that was done. I mean, it's all a little bit, um, I've often wondered, and I've never done the work, so I'm curious about whether or not the forest preserve winds up with a lot of that land because it, can, it doesn't have good, good um, it's de the deeds are, are problematic. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, the, one, the one thing about the, uh, like the Wilmette property, it was, that, was award, that land was awarded to the family. Right. And the family, who, because it was such a vast tract that the, uh, they had, the family could not really monitor the property. And they had squatters here. They had and a lot of problems. So and so when they wanted to divest too. themselves of the property, 
they had to go to the President of the United States. And I'm not sure if it was Polk or one of them, but just before him. But they had to get permission from the right. President in writing and so forth to split up the property. Right. And that's the question that always bothered me about the Robinson family because they received that property from the, the Buddha, the Treaty of Prairie Machine. Right, so it's 1829? Yeah. yeah. And then the Forest Preserve of Cook County comes mm -hmm. in and somehow acquires it. Right. I, my question is, who was the president that authorized yeah, I, I, the best department? I, you know, we are, we are, yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, a absolutely. Yeah, but that was the deal. The last member died. Right. Right, the Robinsons have a very, very, a very, have a very um, idiosyncratic deal with the Forest Preserve. I mean, growing up in Shelly Park, this is what we were taught. Oh, I, and, and I think it's a really. by the family and the Indian tribe up until the last number died in the Right, and so Robinson, met Caldwell. So the other piece of this is all of them were a part of 1812, and they uh, rendered service to Healed and the other American soldiers in one way or another, and they're given. This is this is one of the reasons why they're a part of the 1829 treaty, um, and it's varying kinds of of uh, of um, help that they got. Yeah, you were that. Did you have a? Well, just I was going to yeah. jump in that um, you know, so Sawmish and Blue Coal are the same guy. It's right. Really right. Named for the same guy, but. Um, if you, if you look at the Edgebrook area, all streets go north and south. There are no east-west streets. Right. It's exempt from the city's grid system completely. Well, right. So it's so not even so on the. North. So it's so not even on the. So is North Park. The entire right? Well, North yeah. Park is a lot in, in, in the intersecting north yeah. south. That, north yeah. south streets. Yeah. yeah, I live in 65, 20 minute talk, and you'd come out, and you'd swear that your your uh, parallel uh, to Devon Avenue is not in the But those south. those Robinson will not. Caldwell, those were lands granted before the the plat, before the before the not the plat, but the um, the survey that's going to create um, that that's going to turn this land into real yeah, estate. I, I never, I never uh, bought into the fact that it's it's a, a reservation or it's owned by the Indians. It's just here's an agreement. You've got this land. It's yours to use. But in just doing the recent deeds, you know, serves. Sort of, title search because my property changed hands, uh, me taking it over. It's very difficult. The records are <laughs> it <means laughs> an interesting. not existent. So, uh, you know, sort of along the line, some call was going to come up to me and tell me they're going to take my house. Right. Me. No, I mean, I, I think there's a really interesting part of this is is that is what what is is how it is getting back to what the base for that is. The Robinsons, now the Robinsons also have, so the Potawatomi that are related there into that family who live there are also, many of them have moved north with the Ojibwa, right? So um, I've met a couple descendants of the Robinson clan and they actually, and who are, are um, you're, uh, to your point, who are absolutely a part of the Potawat Potawatomi, um, a, a band of the Potawatomi as well as then Living um, on a, on reservation lands in Wisconsin, so you're you're um, it's stick to your guns. But um, I also think that there is a difference between I see a difference between reservation lands and the lands that these uh, that these folks got in 1829. Yeah. What? Right. That's yeah. I think yeah. We're we're not then we're not disagreeing. Okay. Good. No, no, no. I just I thought maybe we were, but we're not. No, you're absolutely. You're you're right. This, Sorry. The best here. This is a comment, not a question. I think I'm right that Mark Noble, who built this house, lived in Sudrall's cabin. Right. Right. And so. That's a time. <laughs> right. No, no, no. And I should have brought. Yeah. No. You're absolutely right. And that's a wonderful point. The house goes into um, into. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it, that's exactly right. And then it's going to be torn down as it's, uh, it just goes in complete disrepair um, by 34, 35. And Julia Kinsey, who I became completely, um, in, you know, completely interested in after this project and wrote about Julia Kinsey. So Julia Kinsey kind of creates this mythology 
about what's going on. But Noble, that's, that's one of the houses that's used. People going through Chicago in the early 1830s, there's so many people coming in. Everything that's, of any, any house that's available is being used. But nice point, and thank you. <laughs> This so house? Here so far from... Okay, so here's, here's the, the, the question, the answer to, to, my answer to that question, and you guys have to jump in and do this, but um, my answer to that question is, if you take the current boundaries of Chicago, this is the oldest house. I mean, the current. It was, in, current but it was the next to Chicago in 1889. Yeah. So if you, but, but the, like the Clark House was also outside of, I mean, has been outside of the boundaries of what Chicago was at points. So it's, I mean, this is a, I mean, it's been moved. I, it, I think we have, no? Is it always been in Chicago? <laughs> it's within the original plan? The question here. Original city limits okay. of 1837 as, as drawn in 1837, within one block. I take it back. I don't know what I'm doing. This is, I, I, we, we, Stan's got this. Also, Peterson, uh, didn't he own, like, North Park Village land was owned by Pierre Peterson? Was also, I don't know, Salganash related or? Oh boy. I do not know Peterson. Sorry about that. So, anyway, a quick way to hand here. Okay, quick one. Can you uh, advance to the uh, plot uh, slide? which was, I think, right after this. Nope, you go the other way. The first plot of Chicago. Oh, oh. Yeah. Go on. I probably went the long way. All right, that one. What is the little finger there going to the north before the south branch and the north branch? I've never seen that before. Oh, yeah. Well, um, this is kind of a cleanup. There's a lot of... Um, streams and um, smaller tributaries off the Chicago River. This is really swampy. So I think that's what that is. This way. Yeah, this is not. Is it a square mile? Is that a high end? Oh my gosh. Is, is that like a, Wait a how second. Big is I the know you. Plot? Is that about a square mile? I counted 10 plots or? Oh, God. Because I work, well, I work right you around know, there. That is a does. really good question. And, and I don't think Bev, anybody's asked me that. Um, I'm going to find out. Does anybody? It, I well, don't know. I don't think it's, yeah, go ahead, Art. Are those a Chicago City blocks? Yes, and they are. Well, they count. Count. Oh, nice point. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They are exactly, they're still our blocks. <coughs> Yeah, so this is uh, 40 odd years before the fire. You got it. So ultimately, what happens to the Potawatomi? So, they... oh, oh, yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, no, 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 it's an important question. No, it's a really important question. So I'm sorry, that, then thank you for asking it. So 1833, there's a treaty, there's all kinds of, I mean, there's gonna be annuities, there's land that's promised to the Potawatomi, first in, in, in Missouri, and then Missouri, when it goes to Congress, Missouri says they're, they're a new, they're, they're a relatively new state. They say we don't want Potawatomi reservation lands in Missouri, so they're moved to Kansas. And um, the first round of the prairie, what becomes the Prairie Band of Potawatomi, are going to be out in Kansas. But this takes this takes almost a decade. And initially, so Potawatomi are removed. I think the first round is 1835. 1836, 1837, I think it's at least three years. And that's successive waves of Indian agents accompanying groups of Potawatomi westward. This is indeed another, I mean, the Potawatomi describe it as a trail of tears. You know, that, that this is the loss of their land and being moved westward in that way. And they exist today? Oh yeah, oh, oh. In Kansas? A absolutely, uh, no, 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 Kansas was not the moved last, again. they were moved again. So Potawatomi Creek in Kansas, which some of you may know from US history is where John Brown 
um, is, yeah, you got it. So that the Potawatomi are in that area for a while, from this area, lined up out there. And then they're moved to, they, they are moved again to Oklahoma. The Trail of Tears, right? Yeah. And we think about the Trail of Tears as just, so yeah. yeah. And again, the, well, what, the Potawatomi that are moving across southern Illinois are coming out of Indiana. And um, the Potawatomi out of this region are, I mean, I'm working on trying to get some signage up. I teach out in Naperville, and they come through Naperville in one of the years. So I've been having students working on trying to get that together. The, the, yeah. um, <laughs> the Potawatomi came from Indiana. That, that's their trail, they call it the Trail of Death. They came from Indiana, they moved through by military escort across the middle part of the state. Right. And but, all the way to uh, the Mississippi River. Right. So you've got the signage for s at Springfield, for instance. There's the, the, so it's marked. And they do regularly have done bus um, uh, um, where they, where they I, I just, uh, Sharon Hook Strayton, who's a, a Potawatomi descent, um, I just had uh, lunch recently with her talked about doing that trip, the bus trip, to do that, to mark that off with, um, which yeah, just yeah. sounds, trail of, trail of Death. But we have, but the Potawatomi coming out of Illinois and southern Wisconsin are a different, those are different uh, movements. They're all moving towards the same. They're going to wind up together, but not for uh, a whole period of years. So they are removed. Now, the fact of the matter is many people come back. So Robinsons are an interesting crew because that's a place where Potawatomi were welcome to come back on the property that the Robinson had. So you will find year after year people will return from first Iowa and Kansas and, uh, and back and, and will come back in that way. The Ulmets do the same thing. So there is, that's another tie that we can make. They would leave their tribe and they would just come back? Yeah, I mean the question is, um, they leave, yeah, they're, they, they, no one was forcing them to stay. So people came back because it's where people were buried. It's where they had friends. It's where, you know, so they wanted to come back to those places. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This is our son-in-law. He's supposed to be on Zoom. He's a new member, by the way. <laughs> uh, can you ask the question, when the Indians moved from their Chicago area villages after the harvest season, where did they go and how many miles away? Did they go south? Yeah, no, I mean, the Potawatomi from this area, where, the, where um, in, is, is actually at Riverside Lions, uh, the Lawton Tavern around there is where um, they were um, brought together and then that from there moved west. So I know on a first day, in one of those years, the first day they get to Lyle, which was where the Bobiens had a tavern, and they stopped near the Bobien Tavern um, that first night. So it's, it's oh, you know, uh, it's Godfrey, God, God, Godfrey, um, oh God, his name is, He's done a wonderful job of, uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to send it to you. Uh, maybe we can get it. Send it to Stan. Yeah, I will send it to Stan. You said they're doing a season. Yeah. For, yeah, for a period of years. It wasn't they didn't go states away. It's still regional. Well, they're going across the Mississippi River. You know, that's, it's not, I mean, it's not a simple. Oh, oh that's when they're making the, tri that's when they're actually doing the trail. When they're being removed, it's um, and they're going with a an, an army contingent. I was referring to where they stay off season. Manors, oh no, 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 no! I, I, I have now. I have muddied the water. Sorry about that. I'll be happy well, to thank chat. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. And mine is how you get your book. What? Oh, oh, the book. Yeah, I've got, I've got some. Um, if you'd like, there's a, a card if you want to um, to remember what the book title is, and um, I encourage you to go to Amazon. I mean, I, at this point, that's my, my suggestion. Um, uh, it's also in the library. <laughs>